doing today you know when we were worshiping today God just was speaking to me about his power I mean that's what we were praying about right that's in in our worship time we were talking about being broken vessels and having our weakness but connecting it with the power of God and there is nothing like that you guys and you know I just want to take a minute right now and pray as we start because I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel weak. Sometimes I have issues that are broken in my life. And I just want to present them to the all-powerful, almighty God who answers us in prayer. Amen? Amen? Does anybody have anything they really need prayer for? Wow. Okay, so we do, right? Let's pray. Lord, we just come before you right now. And... You are the resurrected Christ, the resurrected King. And you are resurrecting us. And in that resurrection process, Lord, we have this brokenness. We have these issues, these fears and concerns, and we just present them to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Just take it right now and present it to God. Physically do it. Just bring it up to him. It is his thing to take. We cast our cares upon you because you care for us, God. And right now, we just give this to you, recognizing that you are sovereign. You are king. Where we are powerless, you are powerful. Where we don't have hope in ourselves, you are the one we have hope in. Because you are the mighty king, the sovereign God. And we give you all praise and glory. And Lord, we open our hearts to what you have for us today. Lord, you have a message for us, a message of your calling in our lives. And so we pray in Jesus' name that our ears would be open. When you walked on this earth, you wondered whose ears were open, whose hearts were open. And so, Lord, we, we choose right now to open our ears to hear your word, not just physically hear it, but in our souls to hear it and receive it in Jesus' name. Do you guys agree? Amen. 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 All right, cool. All right, so um, we're talking about Christ's body, the power of unity. And we're going to go back a little. We're going to have some, uh, some context here that's really important. <laughs> Let's read this together, all right? Can we read this together? This is the word of God for us today. Ephesians, we're starting Ephesians chapter 4 in our series on Ephesians. Let's read it together. I therefore, you guys, I therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. That could be a tongue twister, huh? Yeah, that's the word of the Lord for us today. So... Let's give some context for this because it's really important. We had J Jody just finished last week with um, this incredible prayer of Paul's that we would understand just the incredible depth and width and height and length of the love of God, right? Right? That's what was last week. What that prayer was was an interruption. Paul interrupts himself a lot. And that prayer was an interruption from the comment that he was making before, which is what I was talking about two weeks ago. And we're going to look at it right now. Paul is continuing this line of discussion today. And he, the way he does that is by going back and, and referring once again to what he was talking about in the context of instructive um, uh, phrases moving forward as opposed to the prayer. And what he was saying was, is, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. And so once again, he is saying, I am a prisoner of the Lord. So let's go back. Let's go back. We just prayed. 
And we'll talk about why he prayed in a minute. But we are going back to that point right now where I was. Okay, I'm thinking, you ever do that? You ever have to, like, walk back and, and okay, where did, what was I thinking? I have to go back to my office and figure it out. And I would, I would actually, the staff sees me do it all the time. It's really scary. I walk back to my office to figure out what I was thinking when I was trying to tell them something. It, it's crazy. But that's what Paul's doing here. He's walking back to his office, and he's saying, okay, I remember. This is what we're talking about right here. Okay? So... We're keeping these two lines of conversation together because they are one line of conversation interrupted by a prayer. And we're looking at it right now. And so what he was talking about beforehand was three things. And you might remember as I shared it a few weeks ago. The first was that we are reconciled to God. The second is that we are reconnected to God. We are reconnected to God. And in these scriptures that, that he spoke of first, that we are connecting together with today's reading, it says, this mystery is that through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. We are reconciled to God. Aren't you glad? And we are reconciled to one another. We are one body together in Christ Jesus. This is our point of conversation for today. And then he wants to say, why? Why is this happening? Why are we reconciled? Why are we reconnected? And it is because of this. It is because of this. He reveals to us this great mystery. This great mystery of the plan of God, the why of God, is found in 3, verse 10 and 11. His intent was that now through the church, through the church, through the church, not through the government, not through you as an individual, although individuals are a part of the church, not through some other organization, through the church, the body of Christ, the living, breathing organism called the body of Christ, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms according to his eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. The manifold wisdom of God should be made known, not just here on earth, but everywhere, everywhere the glory of God would be revealed and everyone would bow their knees before the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? That is God's purpose. That is his plan. And it is a wonderful mystery that was revealed in chapter 3. And now he's going back to it, okay? We're going back to this point now where I was a prisoner. And I talked to you as a prisoner about some of the most important things that you could know. The first thing is we are reconciled. The second thing is we are reconnected in the body of Christ. And the third thing is that he has revealed to us this great mystery, which is that this reconciled body of Christ has an amazing purpose to give God glory everywhere there is a where. Everywhere. Amen. That is a wonderful plan. Do you guys agree? Yeah. And, and so... To give credence for his prayer, that's why he said, for this reason, I kneel before the Father. If you want to know why he interrupted himself, it is because this is a stinking big deal. This is a big deal. It's bigger than anything. And the only way that we're going to get this is if we get this prayer answered. What's the prayer focused on from last week? that the love of God would be revealed, into you, revealed to you in such a degree that you are transformed by it. It is only as the love of God is revealed to you at that level. So it can't be me telling you. It can't be your spouse telling you. It can't be Joel Olstein telling you. It has to be the spirit of the living God speaking to your very soul bearing down on you, weighing down on your heart and telling you that I am passionately in love with you and I will never leave you or forsake you. 
Do you have that convinced in your soul because someone told you or because God transformed you? You need that transforming power. And that's why Paul prayed. He said, for this reason, I get on my knees and I'm praying that the love of God would fill you because this mission is way too impossible unless you have the love of God at that level. You guys get it? This is the context. So now to move on with our scripture for today, we have been called, we have been called. And so this part is, is four of uh, verse one, uh, the, the second part, which is that we should live a life worthy of the calling you have been called. Live a life worthy of the calling you have been called to. There's three parts of this. We have to live our life worthy. The next part is of the calling. And the third part we're going to talk about is that you have been called to. There's three things about this verse that are important to look at. This first part about living a life worthy, this is exactly why Paul was praying. We cannot live a life worthy of the calling of God unless God's spirit fills us with his love. We just can't do it. You could try all you want. It's called religion. It's terrible. Don't do it. I highly recommend you avoid it like the plague. Religion is trying to do it in your own strength, trying to do it in your own will. Let the love of God flood your soul and be changed forever. The reason why you do everything in your life. Live a life worthy. Live a life worthy. You know, we have this treasure in jars of clay, and I shared that picture with you. You probably remember that picture that, that Chris Stringfellow did of this broken jar. And out of this broken jar, the glory of God is just shooting out everywhere. But, but we are all broken, right? We are, we, are, we are all weak and feeble, but it is the glory of God through us that we can live a worthy life. It is, is not, we cannot do it in our own strengths. And, and what am I really talking about here? And what, what is Paul really talking about here is not that you are doing something that is now worth God's favor. There is nothing you can do that is worth God's favor. Is that right? That's right. It is the grace of God and grace alone. So we're not talking about living a life worthy like, I am so good now, and that's why it's, I, I, am, I am worth having this calling. That's not it. That's not it at all. What Paul is trying to say here is, act in a way, act in a way that you recognize that this calling is so phenomenal that you respond to it in an appropriate way. That you respond to it in an appropriate way. You know, John the Baptist, he, he said, bear fruit worthy of repentance. Bear fruit worthy of repentance. And, and this does not mean act in a way that deserves repentance. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, that there is something extremely valuable that is repentance. It is this wonderful thing, and that we should act in a way that fits the value and the nature of repentance. Do you get it? So I'm not saying that you have to live a worthy life. What I'm saying is live in response to this amazing calling. Don't ignore it. It is a wonderful, powerful, glorious thing that God has said, come along and join in this mission with me. Is that not what he said? That's what he said. Here he is, the most precious thing that's ever been done, the most costly mission that's ever been launched, the blood of Jesus Christ, the cross of Christ, the most costly mission, and he takes us broken, and he says, join the mission. <gasps> wow, that is amazing. And the response is, I'm not worthy of it, ever. 
right? But how thrilling it is to be a part of this. How thrilling, God. I want to move forward in this. I want to. It's so profound, the call of God on our lives. So next, walk in a manner worthy of the calling, of the calling, the calling. Not many people live as if they're called. We, we usually live to, you know, we have a few things that we think are kind of important, and we, we do things. And we try to make that happen, and we try to, I mean, let's be honest, we just try to stay afloat most of the time, right? But then here is God saying, you're called. You're called. And this calling is an amazing calling that, that God has. We just heard it. It is that we are, are to participate as the family of God, giving glory to God and honoring him throughout all of eternity in all facets, whether here on earth or in heaven, to give glory to God. This is our purpose. This is our purpose. There is a... There's a really good example of someone who, who does not understand calling. And uh, he's in the Bible. And I, I love the fact that, that there are people in the Bible that are examples to us of mistakes. Aren't you glad? Because we can learn from them. And we can also learn that, once again, that we're not perfect and that's okay. God is. Right? And so here we have this example of Gideon. All right? And... There it is. And let's read this, or I'll read it. The angel of the Lord came down and sat under the oak, oak at Oprah and belonged to Joash the Abrazite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. He was, uh, he was hiding from them. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. This is the calling of God. We could just stop right there for a second. This is God's calling. This is what he was called to do. The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Now, was that something that, that Gideon was not until God just said that? Or had God been calling him his whole life? What do you think? I think that was the call of God on his life, right? The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. And he had no idea. He was hiding, doing some agricultural thing really afraid of, of what was going on in, in, the, in the nation at the time. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time doing the wrong thing because he didn't know that he was called. Each one of us are called by God. It is much more profound and much more wonderful than just staying afloat. It is much more profound and much more wonderful than just achieving the American dream, which isn't. Yes? It is amazing, the call of God. So here was Gideon doing his own thing in his own time in the wrong place because he didn't know his mission. He didn't know his call. And then it goes on. But sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that his fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us in the hand of Midian. And the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have. Here is Gideon looking at all the wrong things. He's looking at circumstances and thinking that's determining reality. How many of you know if you use circumstances to re determine reality, you are not living in it? Reality, I mean. Yes? It's true. And that's exactly what Gideon was doing. He was using circumstances. But this happened. But that happened. Look how miserable things are. Look at our finances. Look at our kids. Look at, look at, look at my job. Look how miserable I am. All these things. 
And he's thinking that's what's real. But what does God say? Go in the strength you have. Whose strength is that? That's the strength of God. God has supplied everything you need for life and godliness, and he is supplying for Gideon. But Gideon was so distracted because he did not know his mission that all he did was look at the things around him. Now, let me tell you, that's an important point that is not in my notes, so I think it's for us. And that is, is when you do not know your mission, you get distracted by very unimportant things. As a church... God is helping us to not be distracted by very unimportant things anymore, but to grab hold of the mission and run with it. It's the exact reason why we're doing the book of Ephesians right now, that we would grab this mission and run with it. Do you guys want to do that? Here's Gideon. He didn't want to. He didn't even know what the mission was. He didn't even know there was a mission. All he was was doing some agricultural work in the wrong place at the wrong time. And then the Lord turned to him and said, go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? This is the third part of what we're talking about in this this phrase of our scripture today. Is that... We are called to a calling. We are called to a calling. So there is a calling. That's good. But we are called to it. Who calls you to the calling? Am I not sending you today? God calls us to the calling. God is calling us to the calling. Are you going to answer God? Is a great question. The church in America comes to church on Sunday, but do we answer God and say, I will. I will go. I will do what God has for us. I will do what God is calling me to do. When I talk about calling, I'm not talking about someone from the church saying, oh, you're called to this thing. I'm saying God himself is going to call you. He is going to direct you. That's what I love about our church. It's life, world, dream. We want to know what God is calling you to do in his dream for your life. And we want to support you in doing that. What is it? Don't miss out and be like Gideon and hide in the fields when God is calling you. God is sending you on a mission. What is it? This word it, from, from our scripture today, it says that, that we were called to a calling. The, the called to a calling, that called part, that is really summoned. It is not, hey, you want to you wanna do this? Hey, I have something fun for you to do. You want to do it? No, it isn't that at all. The King of kings and Lord of lords has his finger pointed at each one of us. Have I not called you? Have I not summoned you to do the thing that you were created for before the foundations of the world? Have I not called you? Wow. That puts some great weight on it, doesn't it? God is calling us. God is summoning us. This is like a like a king. Jeff Harrell, come forth. <laughs> oh, he didn't do it because I'm not a king. God calls us like that. He is calling us. I just remember being summoned by God. I remember how amazing it was. I was in a field on a wine press. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) I was in a living room. I know exactly where it was. I was in the living room of my friend. I had just 
come to faith in Christ a few weeks earlier. I was doing my own thing, waiting to go to church for an evening worship service, not knowing anything. Not knowing anything. And God himself pointed at my very soul and showed me a three-dimensional movie of the rest of my life. Wow. And at that very moment, now, I blew it for a long time in many ways, so I'm not saying you get it right right away, you know? But I could never run away, and I tried. I could never run away from that three-dimensional movie that I saw by God. If you think high tech is cool, let God show you something. Okay, it's way cooler. Amen. And I was profoundly, profoundly changed in my soul. It was not an idea I had. There was no way I had this idea. It was stupid <laughs> <laughs> in my flesh that I would want to do this. It, it, it goes so against who I am in, in my flesh. But when God showed it to me, I was changed. And I could run. I ran 3,000 miles all the way back to New York from California. I ran. I ran back. I ran like two or three times. I'm the best runner there is. I ran all over the place, avoiding this call. For whatever reason, it could have been because I felt like I, I had a lot of issues and I couldn't deal with them. And I felt like I couldn't. Do you feel like you can't deal with your issues sometimes? Amen. So it could have been because of that or because I wanted to do something else. But when I stopped running, and I start, started joining God in what he had planned for my life. It was the best thing I could do. The most wonderful thing. So amazing. Are you answering the call? Are you answering the summons of God? Maybe today is the first time you're hearing that God is summoning each one of us. But he is. Live a life worthy of the calling that you have been summoned to by the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Live that life. Wow. How it changes you. You know, Jesus gave him an example of, of two brothers. One brother, they were talking about obedience at the time, and one brother was, was told to do something. He said, I'll do it! And then he went the other way. <laughs> Didn't do a thing. The other one said, no way! That was me. No way! I can't do that. And he ran away for a little while and he thought, what am I doing? I need to do this. And he ran back and he started doing it. And Jesus said, which of the, one, which of the brothers obeyed the father? Which one are you today? Don't blindly say yes and don't do what God has called you to do. Because God is summoning us as a church. And that's all of us as individuals and all of us collectively. That's the church. He is summoning us to move forward and to see him glorified in our lives first, our families our work life, our neighborhood life, our, our extended family life, and beyond through this valley that God would be glorified. That's his call. If you think you're here for any other reason, you're mistaken. Paul is saying it. God is saying it. This is his call. You glorify him in your life. Okay, so which brother are you? That's the question. Be the brother that says yes to God and does it. Amen. Amen. Be the one who does that, brother or sister. 
So how do we walk worthy of the calling? So his gifts and his call are irrevocable. So this is something you could run as long as you want, but he's still, that call's going to be there. It's going to be there. And until you line up, and believe me, I tried. I'm pretty inventive and pretty creative. I, fought, I, I, I went thousands and thousands of miles to avoid the call of God. It doesn't work. So don't do it. It's irrevocable. It will always be there. You will stop and you will rest and there it'll be. Follow me. Follow me. The other thing about the call of God that's important to know is that these are the ones who were called down here. Brothers. <laughs> this is Paul talking. Think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise. Not many of you were influential. They were wrecks. They weren't educated. There are so many things about us that say we cannot do it in the flesh. But there's one thing about us that says we can do it. And that's the grace and the power of God in our lives. These doofuses change the world by the power of God. Guess who, which doofuses do it next? We do. They're just like us. They're dumber than us. They were just fishermen. What do they know? If any of you are fishermen, I'm sorry. <laughs> Come on. We can do this. Not because of our strength, just like them, but because of the Spirit of God calling us, in us. Do you guys agree? Yes? Are you following this? Good. Okay, so how do we walk worthy of the calling? Now we'll get to that one. There we go. So that, this part of the scripture for today says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. You might think that your calling is going to be glamorous, but this is the calling. This is how you answer the call of God. This is how you live worthy of the calling. No! <laughs> uh, my flesh just cries out, no, I want to be king. You know, when I was a, a little kid, I was the king, right? I told you that, right? When I was a little kid, I ran the show. Everybody followed me. Everybody did what I said because I was the firstborn male on both sides of my Jewish family. So everybody listened to me, and it was a mess. But so our flesh is, 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 is we think it's our king, and it's just crying out, no, humility. That's what this is all about. That's what it is, dying to myself. That's what the call of God is. No! Give me a break. Can't we do something glorious? This is. This is the most glorious thing we can do. The most glorious thing there is. But every fiber of our being says, this can't be it. We resist it with every part of who we are. 1 Peter says, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that he may lift you up in due time. Humble yourself. And then he says, very wisely, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. He's saying that because humility can really stress you out. <laughs> yeah? You humble yourself and you think, oh yeah, but God, I'm right there wrong. It's not fair. <laughs> Or my reputation is being hurt. Aww. <laughs> or I deserve better than that. And then Peter says, cast your anxiety on him. Everything you're worried about, about not getting because you're humbling yourself, cast it on the Lord because he cares for you. Cast it on the Lord. Let him care for you. Don't worry about that stuff. Worry about this stuff. Humble yourself. Let him care about the rest. Amen? Amen? No place better to see this than on my favorite, least favorite place in the universe, Facebook. Should I even talk about it? <laughs> I want to. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, 
Christ followers mistakenly believe that they have a right to criticize and complain. I'm not quite sure where you got that in the scriptures. It's just not there. I think it says don't complain about anything. Don't complain about anything. What are we doing on Facebook, body of Christ? What, what is our purpose from being on Facebook? How does this fit into our calling? What does humility look like instead of individual assertion on Facebook? We just think, well, I'm an individual. I have a point of view, and I'm going to throw it out there for everyone to see. And we think, oh, that's OK. But is that humility? I don't think so. What does gentleness look like instead of rudeness? There's a lot of rudeness on Facebook. Somebody told me that, that you'd never say these things in person that you say on Facebook to someone. You know? And it's true. Why can't we be gentle? What if the entire church, let's just say the adventure for now, what if the entire adventure chose to be gentle and kind and encouraging on Facebook, even if someone misunderstands you and is mad at you. Wow. Is that maybe the heart of Jesus, to turn the other cheek? Is that it? And why do we think that we don't have the rules and the, and the rules? That's a bad word to use. The, the heart of the gospel is not valid on Facebook. Facebook is an alternative universe that we get to live in, and we get to live vicariously and do whatever we want, and it doesn't affect our real world. It does. Yes? Let's live to the glory of God on Facebook. Let's make it radical. Let's let people notice and have them ask questions. Why are you nice on Facebook? <laughs> Why aren't you fighting back? Why aren't you criticizing this person or that person or this candidate or that candidate? Yes, candidates. What does bearing with one another in love look like? You know, the, um, the, a literal translation of that is put up with one another. Put up with one another. Do you have someone who puts up with you? My wife puts up with me. She does. She reminded me. She didn't remind. She didn't say, I put up with you in this way. She just reminded me about one of the things that I have to, she has to put up with me in when we were sitting last night and talking. And, and it's shopping. Shopping. I have a real passion that when we have to buy something, we've already made a decision, like we needed to buy a, a, a new oven. Our oven kind of exploded. <laughs> it was pretty amazing. I, it actually lit the, the um, it, it's almost 20 years old, and it, the coil on the bottom, not because of dirt, just because it was old, lit on fire, and <sighs> We are blowing it. We threw baking soda on it, water on it. Nothing put it out. I had to actually shut off the, the, the switcher thing. What do you call it? Breaker. Thank you. I had to shut off the breaker. <laughs> and and so, so we had to get a new, a new oven. And she knows what that means. That means every store that sells an oven, we're going to at least three times. <laughs> Because I'm not quite sure which one. Which is the best stewardship of our finances? I don't know, honey. And which, which has the right things to it? Like, like the, the one that we got, you could put water in the bottom of the oven, and it steams the oven to clean it. Isn't that cool? I didn't even know they had that. But it really affirmed my desire to want to go back to the store a lot because I saw all these great features. I had to figure out which was the best features. My wife has to put up with this. That's not all. That's the fun stuff, right? <laughs> you can ask her personally about any of the other things. But she has to put up with me. I am so grateful that there are people in my life that put up with me and that are patient with me. 
Thank you for being patient with me. Really. Because I do stupid things. I do rash things. And I need that. And that's what we're called to as the body of Christ. Do you put up with people? Or are you impatient and judge them? Because that's what we're doing, right? When we're not putting up with someone, we're judging them, saying whatever they're doing is wrong in some way, shape, or form. Why can't we be like Paul talked about? Answer this amazing summons of God to love. To love. Why does, do many of the people in the world see much of the church with a stone in its hand? Why? This crushes the heart of God. That there are some valid reasons why people in the world who don't know Jesus and don't know the love of God see parts of the church with a stone in its hand. We have to start living differently. Amen? We have to answer the call. Are we going to answer the call? And it's not just a calling. It is a summons to a calling. It is the King of kings and Lord of lords saying, do this, do this. You know, we shouldn't confuse the rights of an American with the privileges of being a child of God. They're very different. The rights of Americans, free speech and personal expression, that's very nice. But it's nothing as wonderful as what God has given us. So the rights of Americans, free speech and personal expression, the privilege of God's children, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for, my, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. The rights of Americans, the pursuit of happiness, the privilege of God's children, preferring others. So much better. So much better. Can we answer this call? Let's not get confused. America is nice, but it has a very low threshold for what is right and what is good. I I'm sorry, I like the Bill of Rights, I like the Constitution, but it is nothing like the Word of God. Nothing. And we should not confuse the two. We should humble ourselves. Where those in America might think it's okay to say whatever they want, we as Christians grab hold of this great blessing that we have in not saying anything that we want, but only saying what God is leading us to say for the purpose of loving and building each other up in the faith. Yes? The rights of Americans do whatever we can to get whatever we want as long as it's not legal or we don't get caught. The privilege of God's children, lay down your life. So much better. Let's start living in this kingdom. We, we mistake this. This is the call of God on our lives. So here is Jesus in the garden, okay? Here is Peter asserting his American right to defend himself. And I am not talking about Second Amendment issues here, okay? I'm not. I'm just saying, here's Peter, and he wants to defend Jesus, all right? And so he goes to cut off this ear, right? And he does. And what does Jesus say? Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legion of angels? Here is the perfect example of Jesus having the ability to decimate that guy in every way, shape, or form. As the perfect King of kings and Lord of lords, the holy God, he could have done it. What did he choose to do? Hold off, God. Don't let those angels come. I'm not going to do it. 
That's our call. Shall we take it? Shall we humble ourselves? Shall we not answer bad behavior with more bad behavior? In this scripture, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Shall we suffer with Christ? What an amazing thing. This is the call of God. This is it. Let's not be confused about anything else. This is the call of God on our lives. God is summoning us with all his authority, all his power, all his eternal purpose and plans, and he says, follow me and suffer for the gospel. I know this is not what some people might want to hear, but this is the most joyful, most blessed way to live. Yes, it is. So we have to choose. Are we going to choose empty political promises of a better life, or are we going to grab hold of the eternal promises of God, and we're going to go with those? I'm telling you, this country's only been a, around a little over 200 years. It's precarious at best, and I'm going to go with the eternal kingdom. How about you? Well, we have to start living like that. It is, a, it is a far cry from the American dream. Let's start living it. What does that look like? To me, that looks like in... I'm trying to think of like some practical ways that, that maybe this, this helps us understand. Like, and I'm not saying this is, only, this, is, this is the only way it expresses itself, but let's just say we chose to sacrifice... All of us as a church, we're sacrificing our lives, our time, our energy, and we are listening to God, listening to God as to what he's calling us to do. Not a person, but God himself. I honestly think that we would have a waiting list for people to teach kids ministry. I honestly think that we might have a waiting list for people to do the cleaning of the church. I do. I honestly think that your neighbors are going to wonder, what happened to you? Because you're going to start doing things that, that don't make American sense and only make kingdom sense. And they're going to wonder, what's up with them? What do you think? Is that a possibility? I'm serious here. I know it's a serious thought that we answer this call, but will we do it? Are we willing to do it? Because this is the call of God, and I'm not calling you. The King of kings and Lord of lords is calling you. The one who created you is calling you. The one who knows exactly what his dream is for your life is calling you to it. Will you answer him? Will you? It says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. The Holy Spirit is the one who unifies us, and Christ is our bond of peace. He is our bond. He is the one who, that word there in, in, in the Greek has to do with that which brings together. Christ is the one who brought us together, amen? For he himself is our peace and has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier, and now we are one in Christ. We are one in Christ. God has joined us together as the body of Christ. Ephesians 4, the next part says, there is one body and one spirit. There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, and Father of all who is over all and through all and is in all. Paul's making a point. We are one seven times in the scripture here. Seven times in this very short span of time, 
And this is important when you're understanding the word of God, that you look for repetition like that. He's saying it. He's saying one body. Who's that? That's us. We are his body. Romans 12 says, just as each one of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. Look around. You belong to each other. That's what the Word of God says. We belong to each other. You know, we don't recognize this enough in our lives as a church, that we actually belong to one another. We, we don't get together just so that we can get together. We get together so we could be with our Father who unites us all together as one to accomplish this great and wonderful purpose to give glory to Him here on earth and beyond in the heavenlies. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. So we need to answer his call. We need to answer his call. This unity is, is an important thing that we grab hold of. We have to be able to have, be humble. We have to be able to drop our pride, drop our own agendas to have unity, right? We have to be able to do that. Thank you. You know, I have a theory, but it's not just a theory. I've heard a lot of people talk about this recently, which is kind of interesting because it's been my own personal theory for quite some time. The Tower of Babel are all these arrogant people trying to do something to make a name for themselves, and God disperses them through disunity. Acts chapter 2 is the reversal of that. And we see it in the scripture that Paul quotes in Joel. He says, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. There will be no difference. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour on my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. This is a bringing together, a unifying together of the body of Christ. And it says in Acts chapter 2 that they were all together, unified together as one. And it is because of that that lives were being changed and people were being set free. How does that all happen? Paul's prayer, be filled with the love of God. Realize that you are reconciled to him. Realize that we are connected to one another and that we have an amazing call to live out that is not just a call. It is a command from the living God that we die to ourselves and live for one another and for this world and that we see his kingdom come and his will be done. Amen? Amen. Let's take this bread. Lord, we thank you that this bread is broken for us. And right now as, as we prepare, I just ask you right now that you would speak to those that know you today with the decree of the call of God that they would recognize that they are, they, they are not here for any other purpose other than the command of God to do your will that you would be glorified. Speak to them, Lord. Those that don't know you here today, we ask that they would hear that same command of yours that you love them with an everlasting love. And it is because of your death on the cross that now they, they can be reconciled to you, reconciled in relationship with you and know you and walk in the, the glorious plan that you have for them. 
as we take this, make it an affirmation. Does this not honor communion in the best way possible? That as you eat the bread, not only are you affirming the body of Jesus Christ broken for you, but you are affirming that his call on your life is to live for his glory. Amen? Let's eat together. As we lift the cup, we realize that we need to answer the call today. Answer the call, the command of God, the summons of God to love Him and love people. It's not hard because we, it's impossible, and it's only possible through His grace. This is the grace, the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sins. As we drink this, let's remember the blood that cleanses us from all sins. But let's also remember the blood that has now allowed the grace of God to come in to make everything that God has thought in his mind and heart for you possible. His call on your life. Let's drink together. Why don't you stand with me right now? Lord, we just come before you and we thank you that you have placed a call in our lives. It is the most amazing call, but it goes against our flesh. It goes against our constitution, literally. And Lord... We want to choose it. Raise your hand if you just want to choose God right now. You want to choose his plan. Lord, you see these hands. These are hands of people that are saying they answer your call, your command. Would you empower them, Lord? Empower all of us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, I am so excited to see what this looks like as we live it out. Amen. Aren't you? Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Hey, I'm Murph, and we really hope that you enjoyed this week's Adventure TV broadcast. We here at The Adventure have two main goals, to love God and to love people. And we hope that you felt that through this week's broadcast. If you would like to join us on Sunday mornings, we have services at 9 and 11, and also on adventurehome.org. Thank you again, and God bless. All creation worships you All that never came